Alderman, Bill Durrance, with us. Alderman Durrance is a native Savannah and a professional photographer. He graduated from the University of Georgia with a bachelor's degree in journalism and a minor in art and photographic design. He worked for Nikon USA for almost 30 years and helped create the Nikon School of Photography, which he taught for 22 years. With over 50 years experience as a photographer shooting editorial and commercial assignments, and 40 years as an instructor of undergraduate academic programs and photography seminars and workshops, he's now enjoying semi-retirement. But he must have been getting bored because in 2015 he ran for city council, and we know that's not boring in, in retirement at all. Um, and he represents the second district, which includes Savannah's urban core, including the landmark historic district. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alderman Bill Durrance. Thank you, Luciana, and, and you're right. And my advice to you is if you really want to retire, do not run for office. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how that happened. Um, the, um, the program I want to talk, to, uh, the thing I want to talk a little bit about today is uh, Savannah and the fact that it is a, uh, it's really a constantly changing city in a way that a lot of people don't always realize. Uh, before we get into that though, um, at this point, you certainly all know that I'm a city alderman. Uh, I represent the, this area. And I wanted to give you a little bit more background uh, on me, uh, just to give you some, some of the reasons that I have some of this content. <clears throat> I was, um, I'm a native Savannah, and I was actually born here in 1947 at the old Candler Hospital uh, on the, uh, hey Lisa, I didn't see you come in. Um, the, uh, at the O'Candler Hospital by Forsyth Park. And uh, a lot of times when I say something like that, people will say, oh, you mean Telfair, uh, the, the women's hospital that was down at the south end of the park. And no, it was actually at Candler, um, at the O'Candler Hospital. And, and if there was any doubt in my mind, although I was there, I don't remember it, um, I have proof. Uh, my, mother act, my mother saved everything. And this is the bill for my delivery. <laughs> I, I cost, was it uh, $69.82, I think it is. Um, uh, I'd like to think that was a bargain. Uh, probably some folks that wouldn't agree with me on that. Um, the, uh, my experience with Savannah in that intervening almost 71 years now um, has been, uh, I think, probably a little more broad uh, than most people's for a couple of reasons. When I was about three, well, when I was born, we were living over on the east side on uh, uh, Pennsylvania Avenue in the old Savannah Gardens area. Uh, Dad was just back from World War II and that temporary housing that we only just tore down a couple of years ago uh, uh, was where they lived uh, when he first got back. Uh, when I was about three years old, uh, we lived in, uh, on the southwest corner of Jones and Habersham Street, home, a house that's still there, beautiful home. Uh, the reason we lived there, of course, Dad was a blue-collar worker, and the reason we lived there was because it was about the cheapest place he could find to live, and I'm sure if he were alive today, he would be stunned at the difference in the value of that place uh, then and now. Uh, when I was four, about four years old, we lived on 39th Street near East Broad, uh, which speaks a little bit to the changing demographics in the city. That part of the city for some time now has been predominantly African-American, but it certainly wasn't back then. Um, and then when I was about five years old, we moved out into at what at the time was countryside. Uh, it was absolutely rural uh, because there wasn't much past Durant Avenue and, and where we moved was right next door to where uh, Hess Elementary or Hess K through eight school is now. And I grew up out there. Um, so I was sort of paying attention to this city before its resurrection started. Uh, through the 50s, uh, even though we were living out in the countryside, mom was regularly coming in and out of town to get the car to take dad to work. Um, and so we were constantly seeing the city and I remember bits and pieces of that even as a young person. I remember bits and pieces of things like urban renewal and the construction of uh, Fred Wessels and then Hitch Village uh, a little later as, as affordable housing complexes. Uh, of course, they were segregated. Fred Wessels was uh, whites only and Hitch Village was uh, was uh, a black complex at the time that they were built. Well, my education really took off uh, in 1966 
uh, as a, uh, an 18 year old, a very suave and debonair young man. Um, <laughs> and this is about the time I knew Brooks. Um, the, uh, I went to work on the newspaper as a staff photographer. And uh, I think it spoiled me forever because I had a job where I was out all day just wandering around doing stuff. I didn't have a supervisor watching over me. I didn't work any kind of nine to five Monday to Friday job. It was nights, weekends, it was a mix of things. And I think it spoiled me uh, against ever being able to hold down a real job. Uh, it, they just weren't uh, odd enough or something. But one of the things that was great about that job was it took me into all parts of the city. Uh, most people know a city related to a couple of areas, where they live and where they work. Um, but this, uh, just the nature of the job, uh, had me traveling to all sorts of places and it began my collection of images of Savannah. Uh, I didn't realize at the time that I was creating a collection. Uh, when you're 18, you're not really thinking about what happens much past tomorrow. But, and, and you're immortal uh, too, I, I do remember that. Uh, it's unfortunate how that feeling goes away. Uh, the older you get. But, um, just getting a chance to be all over the place uh, and accumulating a variety of images. This is a place most of you wouldn't recognize now. Uh, this is North Beach at Tybee. Uh, today it's a much nicer beach, uh, but just if you went down behind the Tybee Museum, that parking lot, and walked over to the beach, this is uh, where that was. And of course, this was the jetties and uh, you know, what we did at the time to try to hang on to the sand that we're never going to be able to hang on to, it's always going to wash away and we're always going to have to keep putting it back up. Uh, the big building, uh, down on Factors Walk, River Street burning uh, one time, or a, a fence, a homemade fence uh, made out of available materials out on Staley Avenue. Uh, the NS Savannah when it, was a de uh, when it was decommissioned and brought back home. Uh, and even here, uh, at the time, this would have been uh, this photograph would have been made in the 60s. Uh, I had no idea that I'd uh, be spending so much time in this building uh, somewhere down the road. Of course, I've been here for a long time. Uh, my wife uh, has been here for a long time as well, uh, but she does uh, occasionally make the mistake of saying something about how she's becoming Southern, and I have to point out to her that you can't do that. Um, you can sort of do it. Uh, and uh, it's mostly a running argument with us in the best of spirits because uh, the truth is she's a much better Savannian than I am. Uh, she's much better at networking and she actually likes people. Um, <laughs> so, um, at times I think she probably would be the better one to be in this office. Uh, the, uh, we were out one St. Patrick's Day and one of our dogs uh, a few years ago had the odd uh, character of turning green on St. Patrick's Day. And we were out walking around with Katie that day and a friend stopped us and made this photograph and a little while later handed me a, a print uh, of the picture and when he handed me this photograph uh, he said that he had been going through a box of old photographs from years before and he had another print for me uh, at the same time from another party a little earlier. <laughs> This is about the time Barbara and I met and started dating. My, my point with this photograph is that, or these two photographs, is that change is something we're seldom aware of when it's happening. It's incremental and unless there's some aspect of it that is very obviously different, most of the time the kind of changes that are happening to us and to our surroundings are so subtle that we don't really notice them until we've got enough of a time gap in there and then some kind of reference, like photographs, uh, to show us that difference. Uh, until I saw this, I, I had no memory of ever looking that way. Uh, I, I knew that I was skinny uh, 100 years ago. but So sometime, I think this would have been <clears throat> in the late 60s or early 70s. Uh, I made this photograph and a few years ago, a friend of mine, um, we were just out wandering around and um, a few years ago I came across this photograph and I went out and stood in as close as I could get to the same position to photograph the same scene again. And I know that I'm within a few feet of where I was standing when I made this picture uh, and this is what it looks like now. 
This is right here. This is one of the entrances into Armstrong, right there by the Fine Arts Building. And at one point, Abercorn just came to a dead stop right at the end of Abercorn. I mean, right at the entrance, at the last entrance into Armstrong, and it was wooded. And that was it. And that's where that trail was. It just became a little trail that wandered off into, into the, the forest there. <clears throat> it's an old saying. Maybe it's a cliche. But I suppose cliches are uh, cliches because there's a lot of truth in them. Uh, the only thing that uh, is constant is change. That's been true here since the beginning. Obviously, the city we've got today is much bigger and very different from the few, the three original wards that Oglethorpe laid out. <clears throat> he had several rules at the time the colony was founded. Um, I don't think any of us um, would be here today if those were still the rules. Uh, I know at least two of us in the room wouldn't be here today. <laughs> Uh, and no rum would probably keep many of the rest of us from wanting to be around here. Uh, but these rules changed uh, pretty quickly too as soon as the city became a crown colony and, uh, and uh, Oglethorpe went back home. This quote I think is apt and it's easy to see how it would be routinely attributed to Charles Darwin based on his origin of the species. In fact he didn't say this to the best of our knowledge. The quote comes from a business professor at LSU. Uh, but uh, it certainly seems to fit, and, and no matter who said it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, does anyone in here, I know Brooks probably knew, Charles Frazier? Um, Charles Frazier was uh, a member of one of the four families that owned Hilton Head Island before all the development happened over there. And he was the pioneer that started the Sea Pines Plantation development. And several years ago, well, many years ago now, um, I had a magazine assignment to photograph him and spent about a half a day with him, just wandering around uh, Harbor Town and on the golf course and up at his office, nice office. Um, and like what routinely happens when a couple of people that have lived in a place for a long time and seen a lot of change, uh, we started talking about the changes and uh, all the things that had gone on and you know my favorite memory of Hilton Head uh, is when you could just go over there and drive down on the beach and park and have a lot of the beach to yourself. Uh, it's been a while since something like that was an option. Uh, and I was just talking with him as we were photographing uh, about how I had gotten to the point where I just didn't go to Hilton Head anymore. Uh, it had just gotten too crowded, uh, it felt like a 24-7 traffic jam, too many people. Um, he, and, and he was um, very agreeable to my criticism. He said, yeah, um, it's gone too far. Uh, he said, it really has, it's gone too far. And he said, and everybody here knows that it's gone too far. And everybody here knows exactly when it happened. It was the day after they got here. And I think that is a, a concept we can appreciate here as well. I believe we all develop an idealized moment for where we live. We each in our own minds have an idea of when Savannah was its ideal, when it was the perfect spot. Now, how you acquire that and what that time point is, uh, if you grew up here, I, is a pretty complex thing, and I'm not even sure how to figure that out. But I think if you move here um, as a sentient person, I mean, it could be a child or as an adult, but if you move here as a uh, fairly cognizant human being, I think that that ideal moment connects mostly to around the time that you came here. And we see this a lot these days because change is happening so fast in Savannah. And people that have been here for a few years will start saying, what, it's, it's, it's not what I came here for. Uh, and I'm hearing a lot of that these days uh, from some folks in certain parts of town because there are changes happening 
And when they moved into that neighborhood, it was exactly what they were looking for. And without intending to think this way, I think that they assumed that it would be static, that it wouldn't change. And it's natural, I think, up to a point to maybe think that way because you don't think about what it was like the day before you got there. The day you got there is your reference point for what it's going to be like forever, for what it always was, for that matter. You don't know what it was like before. And it's made me think a little bit more about some of this stuff too. Uh, what happened before you got there? Because this, the day you moved here, and the day that you created your own idea of what Savannah should be and it should stop changing, um, is different from the person that got here the year before you and thought that the year before you got here and think you shouldn't be here. Uh, and I think sometimes we need to keep that in mind, that this is always changing and it's very easy to fall into this without even realizing you're falling into this idea of keeping a place static. It's about perspective. What's your point of view? And point of view, both physical and metaphysical, is, is critical to how we think about so much. I mean, at this, what's essentially a movie set at Disney World, uh, if you stand in just the right place, you've got a view of, I assume it's supposed to be New York City, I think that's supposed to be some variation on the Flatiron Building, but if you move off that spot just a little bit, it's just a made up set. And a lot of life <clears throat> is like that. It's just a point of view. It's the perspective, where you're standing, where you choose to stand. In the mid-1850s, I'm sorry, in the mid-1800s, <clears throat> mid I don't remember the exact date, you might, when it was constructed, 18, 1870s, um, the city market was constructed on, it was Decker Square at the time, wasn't it? Ellis. Was it Ellis Square, but it's Decker Ward. Okay. But on Ellis Square, the city market was constructed in the 1870s. And there was outrage about it because it did not suit the Oglethorpe plan, putting commercial activity like that in a square. Well, it lasted a long time, but we eventually took care of that and, and we got rid of it. <laughs> Uh, and this is what we got, a parking garage. And everybody was outraged that we got rid of the farmer's market. So part of that perspective is time related to. A, a lot of what you hate today, somebody's going to love 100 years from now. Um, it's just, that's natural. And the way things keep changing, that's always going to be the case. This was, even as City Market became more vibrant, things started happening there, uh, restaurants, and as the city became uh, more and more active, uh, more and more tourism, the uh, garage was still there. But little by little, things keep changing, and at least sometimes they do change for the better. And now a view from the same spot is a much nicer view, um, and having the square Rehab like this um, is, is a big improvement over that parking garage, certainly. And we still have a parking garage. We just went underground for it. I believe this would have been in the early 70s, the old Talmadge Bridge, the original Talmadge Bridge. And I'm photographing from Hutchison Island here. And there was nothing there. Some spoils platform for river dra uh, uh, dredging. But that was pretty much it. You can even see, uh, at the time it was probably still active, the old power plant uh, right here on the riverfront. Today, of course, we've got a much newer bridge and we've got a lot of activity happening on Hutchison Island. This is from the roof of the CETA building. It's got CETA activity here. There's some, uh, some dock activity down here and a lot more things going on on Hutchison Island today than there was then. Uh, with the Weston and the Trade Center and some other things coming. But you can see we needed that taller bridge 
You can see from the piers of the old bridge that we got, I think it was about a 50 foot increase in elevation, uh, which is now not tall enough. I, I, I can't imagine that we're ever gonna, I suppose at some point we'll have to do something about needing a taller bridge. Uh, I don't know where we even begin to have that conversation, uh, but uh, things change and, and we still don't get things right. Somewhere down the road, it's still not enough. Tybee, uh, an absolute monument, or not monument, but a, a, a landmark at Tybee through all, most of my life and long before was Tybrisa Pavilion. In 1967, it caught fire. And you can imagine how long these old creosote timbers burned. Uh, I was actually at home on the south side of town when I saw on the late night news that it was burning and I had time to get to the beach and make this picture. In addition to the pier, uh, which was wonderful, the fishing pier that went out and right in this area when you first went up on the pier was the roller skating rink. On the other side, uh, away from the beach, were bathhouses and uh, bowling alleys, uh, snack foods, a bunch, a bunch of things like that, and if you went a little bit further down the beach, there was the old brass rail, which I'm sorry I was never old enough to go to while it was still there. It was an uh, old nightclub, classical nightclub, where groups like the Ink Spots would show up to perform. It took a little while, but after that burned down in 1967, we did eventually get uh, another pier back at the, uh, at the, uh, on the Strand. Thunderbolt, at one point, was a huge uh, fishing village, uh, shrimping village. And somewhere along the way, uh, the shrimping started dying. The industry started dying. There was less and less profitability. We saw fewer and fewer boats. There were a few that were there, still performing, still dredging, not dredging, uh, still saning uh, stuff up. Unfortunately, a lot of what uh, they were catching at the time was large bales of marijuana. And so there was a, a, a local political scandal at one point uh, in Thunderbolt, including some officials uh, for the uh, importation uh, that was going on there at the time. Uh, shrimping has never really recovered, uh, at least in this area. And today, again, it's kind of a mark of what's going on with the city. What we've got uh, is condos and pleasure boats. To editorialize for a minute, I'm not sure that's an improvement. Uh, but I just like looking at the old fishing boats, the shrimping boats. Johnny Harris was a hop in place back in the 60s and 70s. It's funny because um, it wasn't a hopping place for a long time and it got really busy once they said they were going to tear it down. Uh, but that didn't save it. Not sure what's going to happen here now. There's been two or three plans uh, since the demolition uh, and nothing has come through at this point. But uh, inevitably there will be some development happening in here. Um, not sure what it might be, but with the nature of that community, it's probably going to be some sort of large scale commercial sort of project. Some things haven't changed too much. Uh, there's obviously a difference, but the structure hasn't changed so much. This is around 32nd, 31st to 32nd Street on Whitaker. Uh, many years ago, when confectionery stores were our convenience stores at the time, you know, you'd drop in there to get a little candy or a Coke, or something like that, uh, little neighborhood stores. Uh, the building today, <clears throat> of course, most of you probably recognize the Berrien House. What we had at one point was a thriving Western Auto store here. Now, at this stage, it was a uh, cheap furniture store. <clears throat> there was a shoe repair place here for a long time and a finance company, but this building just sat for the longest time. It, it really began to look like nothing was ever going to happen with it, but now it looks like this. And we have this great art supply store here with Blick. <laughs> there is a, uh, a genre 
in photography these days called ruin porn. And it's about photographers that just love going around making pictures of rundown and uh, deteriorating buildings. Uh, apparently Detroit has been a great mecca uh, for this. But fortunately for us, a lot of the stuff that 20, 30 years ago you could photograph this way isn't that way anymore. Um, I, I think a lot of times when people think about the changes in the city, there's a tendency to think about those changes in a negative way, and I've certainly been very guilty of that myself. But all of it hasn't been negative. In fact, the more I've done things like this, the more I have had to change my own attitude about some things. It's amazing that um, I think working on city council has made me a more positive person than I was before. Now, that's a relative thing. It doesn't mean I'm actually a positive person. It just means I'm more than I was. <laughs> I remember mom shopping here when I was a kid. Of course, I remember when Broughton Street was the only place you could go to shop. You know, that's where you'd go in August when school actually opened at a reasonable time later in September. And uh, you'd go down to do your preschool shopping. And then gradually it deteriorated and there wasn't much going on. Uh, you can see no cars, no people, the, the old rundown shop here. And when I first pulled this photograph out a while back uh, to put this presentation together. I was trying to remember when this picture was because I figured it was a long time ago. It was actually 1996. This is an Atlanta Olympics banner right here. So 22 years ago, this is an idea of what Broughton Street looked like. Just what to me seems like a very short time ago. And today, it's this. You. Can you imagine finding parking like this available downtown today? <laughs> people on the street, and it's not just people on the street. This is one of the things that struck me a, a few months ago, maybe six or maybe five or six months ago. For some reason, I mean, I, I've gotten so old that I don't really go out at night much anymore. I, um, it, it, if I'm going to fall asleep drinking, I would rather it be in my lazy boy than at a bar somewhere. Um, so uh, I had gone out on a Friday or Saturday night, and I remember Friday and Saturday nights downtown being dead. There was nothing going on down here. And when I came out, and this, there was, it wasn't a special weekend or anything like that, but the streets were packed with people. It's such a huge difference here today with all of that. You know, vacant buildings, some traffic down here, some activity still, but today, beautifully restored, lots of activity, people on the street. Remember Welch, Welch Pawn Shop? Now this one is an odd one to me because this restoration was done a good 20 years ago, maybe longer. I don't, do you remember any date on that? Yeah. Mills did it. It was a long, it, yeah, it had to be a while back because Mills has been dead a while. Um, I don't think anybody's ever lived in this house. I think this property has been empty since the restoration. I've never seen anybody in there. That, that may not be right, but I just, I've never seen any activity in this place. Is that a watch shop? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Good. This is at the corner of Habersham and Broughton Street, southeast corner of Habersham and Broughton. Now, one thing I don't quite understand is this is where this pawn shop was, but if you go to the other side where the Kennedy Pharmacy is, and you walk a little farther down the sidewalk, the pawn symbol is actually embedded in the sidewalk there. So there must have been a, a different pawn shop. Do you remember Brooks? What? Oh, that's right. Uh -huh. So I guess it was a different pawn shop. <laughs> well, there would have been that. This was at uh, 407 Bull, and uh, this is what it looks like today. Right across the street. It's old building, pretty bad shape. Even the street. It's a little bit better today. Building's much nicer. The building next to it, uh, 
has had its trials and troubles, but now this will be the facility for uh, Savannah Tech's new uh, Culinary Arts Institute. It's going to be an amazing building and lots of activity. It's going to be terrific. This was, might have been as late as the 90s, uh, here on Factor's Walk. And today. Central of Georgia Terminus. This is where the train, the, the Nancy Hanks came in. Anybody here? Well, I'm sure Brooks rode the Nancy Hanks. I did. So we had, what, three of us that ever rode the Nancy Hanks? Um, I, I, we need, I, I would love to have a train back to Atlanta. The uh, field over here with the fence and all the grass and everything is actually Battlefield Park now. Uh, it was just old rundown buildings with easy access to anybody that wanted to go sneaking into the buildings and the grounds. Uh, taking the fifth on that. Uh, and of course the, uh, where the, the train came in, which now is the railroad museum or the history museum inside that area. This is on uh, Barnard Street, just south of Gaston, on the west side of the street. And a lot of changes to this. Uh, one of the things, as I was looking at this picture, I realized one big change here that's interesting. I mean, there was a lot of businesses in this little tiny building. They had this office supply center, and we had contemporary furnishings, you know, appliances, catalogs, everything else. But we also had uh, pelote builders, pelote paving, and pelote trenching and sewer pipe. <laughs> and Benny's done pretty well since then. Uh, he's got the whole floor, uh, I think it's the 14th floor, with one of, anyway, one of the floors in the Savannah Bank building facing Johnson Square now, so. And this is what that looks like. Broughton Street, this was almost certainly in the 60s. Um, Parks University shop is right here. Uh, Merle Norman today is Marshall House. And I'll, I'll tell you, whatever anybody's opinion of Ben Carter might be, and I'm sure for most of us it's mixed, um, you've got to give him credit for one thing. He has made Broughton Street a lot prettier than it was. I mean, this facade, I watched this happen over several months as this work was done, but this facade looked just like this. And they peeled all of this off and restored all of this brickwork and replaced these windows and it's just absolutely beautiful. And, and we do have those treasures starting to come back now. And I guess part of the education for me and changing my attitude about some things, because uh, I was resistant to a lot of these changes for a while. And uh, there are still a lot of people in the tourism industry that will tell you I'm anti-tourism, which is not true. It's, a, it's much more nuanced than that. Um, but one of the things that I have to give credit to our popularity is our ability to get this stuff back because it costs money. And there have to be, has to be money coming into the community to get these kinds of things. And, uh, and we're very fortunate to get, well, in the first place, we're fortunate to have this still available to recover. I've had a theory for a long time that Savannah was fortunate in its poverty from uh, all through the early 1900s because nobody had any money to build anything so they didn't tear anything down. So by the time people had money to start doing some nice things around here, we realized the value of what we had and we held on to it. And I think a lot of communities haven't had that benefit. So, uh, so I suppose that in some ways you can find a silver lining in poverty. We lost this one. And in my lifetime, um, I remember this because my senior ring dance was here at the Old Vesota. There was a rock and roll radio station that was on the veranda and my sister dated one of the disc jockeys so she was always hanging out down there. So it was a really cool place. The waterfront has certainly changed. Uh, back in the 60s, even the early 70s, 
<clears throat> there wasn't much going on. I mean, the riverfront was mostly warehouses and some businesses there, but uh, in terms of public activity, there wasn't much. There were four, and I can never remember what all four of them were. There was Harborside, there were four bars down there that, in some restaurant capability, but Harborside, Boar's Head, um, and I can never remember the other two. Hmm? The, the other end? Uh, no, the head is the other end, I think. Well, no, that might have been, it, it was the other end of the Boarshead, so that might have been the third one. Chart House? No, no, Chart House is a newcomer. <laughs> yeah, in Savannah terms. Um, the, uh, no, Chart House came after a lot of the renovation stuff was done down on the river. But the, uh, when you went down there around this time, of course you really didn't go down there at night, uh, and you didn't walk on these docks uh, if, unless you wanted to take the chance that you'd wind up in the river, because there was no protection. There was nothing to keep you from walking out on these old wooden piers, uh, and there was lots of holes in them that you could step right through. But uh, as I said, uh, I was a photographer at the, I was became, becoming a photographer at the time I was still immortal. Uh, and the two are, are deadly combinations because photographers think if they're holding a camera, nothing can happen to them. In 1977, the riverfront uh, restoration project was just finishing up. Uh, most of the work had been done, the physical work had been done. All of the Belgian blocks had actually been pulled up and relayed. Just probably need to be done again at this point. Uh, but, um, but this, this was taken care of. Uh, the planting was just starting. Everything else was pretty much finished. And just starting to do the planting along here. You can see we still had the old bridge. The, um, you'll notice also that there's a nice gap right here. Well, today, uh, all of this has grown up a little bit. And from the same position, it looks about like this. You can see the boar's heads even got a little bit nicer awning out here now. Of course, the riverfront is filled up with all kinds of shops and commercial activity. Um, and that little gap is no longer there. Uh, we have this huge thing sticking out uh, into the river. <clears throat> and something that I probably would have never thought was going to happen in the city through most of my life is that um, we're running out of room to do new stuff downtown. Uh, we've infilled much of the land. Most stuff has been restored. Some of it might need to be in, uh, in, might be in need of some rehab. Um, but we need some expansion capabilities for our landmark district. And we're very fortunate that we have that. Now, that's different from just having a place, you know, like the, the further suburban areas in the county where you can develop housing and people can live and work. Um, the reason we need the expansion zones close to the historic district is because of so much of the business that's here, the tourism industry, and the fact that so many younger people today want to live close in in the city. So having the ability to expand our core is really important. It's not an option that a lot of places have. Um, and, and in some ways it's a little tricky for us because the, uh, when Oglethorpe settled here, there was still a pretty conventional wisdom that you build on high ground. Uh, we've kind of walked away from that, it seems like, because, you know, we've been, uh, I mean, we've got so much of our city that's built in marginal areas now, and there's not much choice if population's going to grow. So these, these expansion zones for our urban core on the west and east side are low, and we have to address that. But it does give us some real opportunities to, to grow the city some more and to have some, some uh, real opportunities for uh, increasing the sort of dynamic quality of the city. And uh, the west downtown expansion, the canal district, uh, the new arena, is part of that. I think that there's still, and I admit that I was guilty of this at first too, there's still this sense that the arena is somewhere way out there that it's not really part of downtown and can't be part of downtown. There is a psychological barrier there, certainly, and a visual barrier because we've got the, uh, the highway system where 16 comes in here, through here, 
and where it travels on over to connect to the bridge in 17. So you've got that visual barrier. You've got Chatham Steel here, which seems to be a visual barrier. Now, all of the routes that we're going to have available to go to the canal district are available to us now. But, I mean, Quinette Street is there, Louisville Road is there, and we may have some additional routes. But it, it, I think for a variety of reasons, people tend to think of this as out there somewhere. But if you look, Forsyth Park is right here, and straight down Gwinnett to where the arena will be in this whole canal district. Battlefield Park, the visitor center, all of the stuff is just very close. And what we've got an opportunity to do is create something that will be an amazing addition to the city. Uh, something remarkable. Um, the Springfield Canal, which is a very functional canal. It's drainage for much of the western and southern part of the city. We'll have to do a lot of work uh, with that, expanding it. But what it's also going to allow us to do over time is this canal could even have boats on it that move people, just like Riverwalk in San Antonio that move you from the arena here all the way right into downtown, uh, to the, right into the heart of downtown, to places like the multimodal center right over here. The uh, <clears throat> city is looking to um, build a new municipal and public safety complex that will probably be in this area somewhere to really uh, improve our capabilities, our efficiencies. I mean, we own a lot of old rundown buildings, and uh, including the one we're all sitting in. Uh, and uh, a lot of infrastructure needs a lot of work. Uh, but being able to consolidate our staff into a new facility uh, will really improve a lot of the way we provide services in the city. We'll have playgrounds, uh, a, a, a pond, not a pond, but a lake here uh, for activity. And then, of course, uh, this is all going to be available. Uh, this is all private land. This is not city development. This is private land that will inevitably be developed uh, for uh, a variety of public activities, restaurants, shops. You know, we'll see bike paths, running trails. Uh, and then, of course, we'll have uh, the arena in this area. The old waterworks building sitting here at Stiles in Gwinnett gets rehabbed in this whole area, the entrances to Cloverdale and Carver, uh, Carver Village will be polished up, uh, be real improvements in that neighborhood visually. The, the, the waterworks from the other side, all of our public work stuff here will be demolished and all of this will be improved. This is the waterworks building that we'll be doing uh, rehab on. The original idea for the arena was that it would be right here with this plaza. Today, that idea has been changed. This is the waterworks building, and the arena will be back here. And I really like this change in the design. It was done for practical reasons, but I think, personally, I like the, the approach, too, because I like having all of this mixed use. Uh, it could be office space, could be hotel, could be commercial activity. But the reason for doing this, pragmatically, is right now all of our public works facilities are right in here. And if we have to wait until we move those to start on the arena, it'll push it another three or four years out, uh, maybe longer than that. So we can come back in this area right now and begin with the arena project, getting started on the arena. And we should be seeing work on that by the end of the year. Uh, it's moving. So all the activity that we'll be able to have along Springfield Canal, bike paths, walking paths, uh, some boat activity possibly. All of this stuff is connected. Um, Julie, I'm sure you're familiar with this kind of list. Uh, the number of projects that we've got going on in the city. Uh, all of this stuff uh, connects one way or the other. If no other reason, then it just takes an awful lot of staff time managing all of this stuff. Uh, at the end of 2016, about 300 capital projects in the city, work that's going on in some stage of, of activity. It's all a puzzle, how you pull these pieces together, how you prioritize. Now, this is a puzzle, a lot, kind of puzzle a lot of people like. I, at one point in my life, preferred a little more of a challenge. Um, these were interesting to put together. When you're working with these things, too, all the pieces aren't equal. You do have to create priorities. Some things are more important than others, and how you order that is a big part of how the city runs. Part of that, of course, is public safety. The biggest, one of the biggest ones, as far as this council is concerned, is public safety, and we've had some problems. 
the uh, thing we feel like we've done is make a real difference with us too. And this is some older statistics uh, in reporting, but we are, I think the number now in part one crime is we've reduced uh, by 20%. Homicides the, in 2015, there were 53, uh, 50 the next year, 35 the year after that, and I think so far this year it's 10 or 11. So we're seeing some real improvements in that. Other long-range plans, Duran Avenue, the Project Duran, where, uh, and a lot of this because there's uh, federal money involved is taking a long time to do an environment impact, environmental, environmental impact statements and that sort of thing, but. Uh, the long range plan would be as 516 comes in here, this is Montgomery Street, as 516 comes in, you would just have uh, access on and off 516 here that would create an, uh, an entrance into Hunter, uh, or you could continue on around and get on to Abercorn if you're headed that way. This is a huge morning and afternoon traffic issue for the city, but this would help alleviate a lot of the traffic along Duran, the other parts of Duran. Uh, most of you've probably heard something about our Broughton Bay and River Street uh, streetscape projects. The uh, first that we'll be beginning with is Broughton and of course we'll make these a lot more interesting places to be and to hang out. <coughs> we would have been started on Broughton already except we bumped into a couple of things uh, with some, uh, some of the underground aspects of some of these businesses here and we've had to take a little time to figure out how to make sure that we don't create leak problems for their businesses and that sort of thing before we get started but the Broughton Street project should be getting started before much longer. Bay will be a much more pedestrian friendly place. And River Street, uh, one of the things that I really like about River Street is that we'll be getting rid of the public parking lots and that will become much more useful for cafe, sidewalk cafe space or other kinds of activities. The uh, Rusakis Plaza, the way it's designed now, will be turned around so that uh, any kind of activity that's happening like that will actually be on the river and the people watching will be facing the river. Personally, I'd like to see all the traffic removed from River Street, but I don't think I'm going to win that one anytime soon. In other parts of the city, of course, we own the shopping center um, and its own waters, and eventually uh, we're going to see some exciting things happening there. I think that a lot of what's been happening, and it may not even be visible to folks that aren't involved in this kind of stuff daily, but our <coughs> opportunity and enterprise zones where there are incentives, uh, tax uh, uh, deferral incentives and um, <coughs> job creation incentives in this opportunity zone where the, uh, at the west end of River Street, Montgomery and MLK Quarter, uh, Waters Avenue and Pennsylvania Avenue and then the military zone out here, um, it seems to me that Montgomery MLK, there's a lot more that's going to happen there, but I think that has enough momentum now that that's just going to keep going. Uh, I don't think that there's any question that MLK and Montgomery, all the way to Victory Drive at least, and probably all the way to 52nd Street, is going to develop over the next few years very heavily. Pennsylvania Avenue, some things have happened over there with, here's my, just pointing out, here we go. Uh, the Pennsylvania Avenue building, you know, with, not building, but the Pennsylvania Avenue area, the uh, park structure that we're putting up, the Pennsylvania Avenue Resource Center uh, we'll be starting on, the uh, Savannah Gardens uh, the development that the city did over there a little while back. So I think that, uh, and of course Starland, uh, Starland area has been a really hot place. There's still a lot more development that's going to happen there. But I think the next thing, I think most of those things are something that's already in place, things are moving. And, and maybe I'm just, uh, maybe this is wishful thinking, but I don't believe so, but I think Waters is our next uh, big event space where we're going to start seeing real investment. I think we're already starting to see a little bit now. It's right at the beginning of people starting to invest. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of room for that over there, uh, a lot of properties available. We know we're seeing growth in the community. Uh, these numbers are amazing. Last year was the third highest year on record, and it was a the highest was the year before that in terms of uh, permits issued, the value of permits issued, commercial permits, residential. But this, is, this is something that I'm really thrilled to see because we had things in place that really disincentivized residential development in the city and we've made some changes to that and we're seeing the benefit of that now 
with this level of residential development starting to happen. First, one man's trash is another man's treasure. And, you know, for everybody that thinks something that's happening is really good, there's going to be somebody that doesn't like it. Uh, these are just uh, the realities, you know, that we live with in, in an urban core. We've had a couple of issues that I think we've addressed pretty well. Uh, they aren't perfect solutions. There are no perfect solutions. But we had proliferation, certainly a perception of a lot of proliferation of hotels in the community. Now, as long as hotels are still operating at 80% occupancy rate, people are going to keep building more hotels. But one of the things that we had a concern about was that hotels might start infringing or were a little bit starting to infringe in residential areas and places that needed a little bit more protection. So we started working to address that. The other thing was it seemed like a lot of the hotel growth we were getting because that was the best return on investing in a piece of property because we had restrictions on residential development that required minimum unit sizes and a maximum number of units that could be built within a space. And so the, the amount of money that you could make building multifamily residential was far less, especially if you had to do parking that was a higher parking requirement and did not generate revenue compared to what a hotel would do. So we've done a couple of things to help reverse some of that or flip some of that. One is uh, in many areas uh, substantially reducing the minimum unit sizes so that we can create units in the 400, 500 square foot size uh, that appeals to, to younger people who can, uh, with our land values downtown, of course, the only way you make a unit cheaper and affordable uh, is to make it smaller. Uh, so allowing these small units to be built, allowing more units to be built, uh, we've started addressing some of this. The hotel issue, we, instead of having one category of hotel, which is just hotel, it could be big, little, there was no distinction. We created a small hotel category, and then we started defining where you could build small hotels, the yellow areas, where you could build larger hotels, which is more than 75 rooms, and where you can't build a hotel anymore. No hotel construction at all. Short-term vacation, certainly a touchy subject with a lot of folks in the community. It's another lodging use, uh, confined primarily to the urban core. And just like the hotel ordinance, which took, I think it was eight months of stakeholder meetings back and forth and back and forth until we came up with something that everybody could sign on to. Same thing happened with vacation rental ordinances with residents, uh, vacation rental owners and vacation rental management people. and came up with some plans that really helped start containing the growth uh, of that so that no area of town, no ward, uh, residential component of any ward can have more than 20% uh, short-term vacation rentals now. Zoning. Uh, zoning is at the core of so much of how we manage the city, what we allow, what kind of use we allow, and where. And we have a 1960s zoning ordinance right now that is so antiquated and it's been revised and, uh, and amended so often that it's just unmanageable today. So we are slowly but surely working our way through a new zoning ordinance that we hope to have finished by the end of the year to take effect the first of the year. Tourism is a huge thing in the city, but it has grown with little direction for a long time. So one of the things that we did last year was put together a tourism management plan lots of stakeholder meetings, lots of neighborhood meetings, lots of industry meetings uh, to come up with the best way to manage the continued growth of tourism in the industry in the city. Uh, blight is certainly a, a big issue in lots of parts of town. Demolition by, by neglect uh, has been a problem here. Uh, what we'd like to do is get people who can't or won't take care of a piece of property to sell it. At least let somebody else have it that might do something with it. And one of the tools that we have now to do that is if the court rules that you're, I mean, there's, there's some legal definitions of what's actually a blighted property. It's not just because somebody looks at it and thinks it's run down. But if you qualify, if you, if you are qualified as a blighted piece of property, we can add a seven times multiplier to your property taxes as an incentive to do something with the property. We also got the state to change the rules about eminent domain. Uh, after some poor decisions in Connecticut uh, some years ago, the legislature uh, created a restriction on any property that the city took by eminent domain that required us to hang on to it for 20 years. Well, if we're taking a piece of property that we're going to use for public use, we're going to create a park or something like that, that's fine. 
But if we're taking a single family residence because it's got its heirs property, the title is not clear, uh, and we need to do something about that because the 20 cousins that own it won't, no one in that 20 cousin group will take responsibility for maintaining the property. If we were to take something like that to try to get something done with it, we have no use for it and we would be holding it for 20 years. So last year the we got the state to change that rule so we can now actually take these properties and turn around and sell them right away, clear the title when there's a title issue. The only restriction, and this is something that we were all happy to live with, is that it has to retain its original use. So if it's residential property, it has to stay residential. But these things, the blight tax and the new ability to use eminent domain is allowing us to do programs like the Savannah Shine program. Uh, we identified all of the neighborhoods in the city, rated all the neighborhoods based on amenities, uh, average incomes, just a variety of things. And now we're working our way down the list. We'll spend about 18 months. Uh, we started with Edgemere Sackville uh, as our number one community, and we're putting in new playgrounds, fixing the streets, fixing the sidewalks, uh, just doing anything we can to re-energize and revitalize uh, that neighborhood. At the end of this project, we'll move on to the next one on the list. We've got so many more people here now. Five minutes, so many more people here now. And uh, no more water than we ever had. We simply can't provide water from the Floridian Aquifer anymore. So wastewater treatment and surface water treatment is uh, a must. So things like the bio, uh, biosolids project that we're doing uh, is going to help us uh, provide uh, a longer, better water supply. We've got the impound uh, out in, uh, is that in Effingham? Actually, the, the impound lives in Effingham now. But it's a reservoir, actually, that we may need uh, to also have ready supply of water. So we're doing a lot that way. We've got these huge new projects on the west end of River Street that are public-private partnerships. I mean, the hotel, of course, is private, but we're doing the stairwell and elevator here. We're doing the river walk and the garage uh, there to keep, keep things moving. Uh, they're, they're huge. The, the Plant Riverside project is the largest single development project in the history of the city, $250 million. At the east end of the river, another huge project, $600 million development project with what was called Savannah River Landing, now Eastern Wharf. If you stood at the east end of the Marriott's um, patio at one point, this is what you would see. Today, it's like this. And all of this is starting to move. We're actually seeing the residential construction coming up right now. It's coming, uh, it, the sticks are coming up. So we're getting all of this development, which will have some commercial. We'll have public garages here wrapped by apartments and commercial activity, office space, hotels, a riverfront park. Of course, the river walk goes along here. Uh, all of that's public. All of this will be public. This is a rendering of what some of that's going to look like. This is what Pennsylvania, uh, President Street looked like in that area, of course, during uh, Hurricane Matthew, uh, because some people think they can drive through this. Uh, this is what it looks like today. If you looked over at Hutchinson Island years ago, that might be what you see. Today we've got the Weston and the Trade Center. But we've also got plans for a marina and mixed-use development here, expansion of the Trade Center, another, I believe, 300-room hotel, uh, just so much what Charlie Morris has done with Trustees Gardens taking uh, the old foundry building. Really rehabbing that, did a beautiful job. The development that's coming for the Oglethorpe property. Our parking matter study is really addressing the need to deal with how we take care of transportation downtown. Uh, part of that is introducing a free shuttle system, uh, recognizing that you know parking is scarce and we have to find a way for people to move around. It's not just based on everybody being able to drive and park where they're, where they're going because that's over. That's not going to happen again. We've got the free shuttle routes and the CAT system the high-end fixed route bus system has, a, uh, at, at the best routes, the most active routes, has about a 17 or 18 passenger per hour average. Our north-south shuttle, the, the Forsyth shuttle, has a 44 passenger per hour. Uh, 
uh, rate. It has been an immense success. Of course, CAT, we're reworking all of our route system. We're hiring, uh, we've contracted with the, probably the premier transportation planner in the country to spend the next year going through all of our routes and coming up because they haven't been changed in decades. We're adding more bike rental stations trying to uh, trying to bring the city into a mindset that pedestrians and bicyclists are a better way to move around in many cases. I have lost some battles, uh, but the war's not over. If you plant a seed, you never know what's going to happen. And I always try to remember when I'm working on some things that I know I'm not going to see through to the end because I just can't be here that long. Uh, I try to remember the folks that planted our majestic oak trees. Uh, knowing that they would never see what we see today with those trees. Um, and then finally, have I got two minutes left? Okay, finally I'll just say that uh, maybe the biggest change in Savannah for me has been me um, in getting this job because I am uh, much more comfortable as a hermit. Uh, this is the kind of environment I'm happier in um, doing this sort of thing. But uh, being in this job has uh, probably made me a nicer person to be around. I'd like to think that anyway. But this, is, uh, this has been my past, uh, and being in this urban environment and dealing with this urban environment in a much more intense way has been a real change for me. Uh, an interesting education. You know, I have traditionally preferred uh, animals to people. I trust them. Uh, I mean, I trust them to try to kill me and eat me, but I, I know what their motive is. You know, so. But one of the things I've learned as a photographer after 50 years is if you look right, you'll find what you're looking for. And you can find the kind of natural environment or animal activity or solitude uh, right here in the city if you just look for it. And that's it. Thank you. And, and I apologize for being two minutes long. While we do that, if you might um, make any comments, there's a little survey there, and we can pass around pencils if anybody needs that. But if you'll do that before you leave, I'd appreciate that. Does anybody have any questions for Alderman Durns? Yes, ma'am. How many people that you see downtown during a day are actually living here and not tourists? Because I, when I go downtown, I'm usually ushering or something, and everybody that I see to me looks like a tourist or a student. So how many well, residents of Savannah actually use that? I mean, dress codes have gotten so sloppy these days, it's hard to tell the difference between a <laughs> resident and a tourist. Um, I, I, would, I would hesitate to try to guess. I'm sure that a lot of what you see is tourist visitors, because if you're a resident here, you're probably not going to be outside in this heat. Um, the, uh, and you're probably at your job. I mean, I know when I travel, I have a whole different way I do things than when I'm, when I'm home. When I'm home, I'm, I'm working, doing something, so I'm going to be inside. I'm not just going to be out roaming the streets. So I, I suspect that the bulk of the people you see probably are visitors. Now, one of the things that the tourism industry likes to do here is make sure that you're saying visitor and not tourist, because when we talk about the number of visitors we have, that's different. You know, the, the number of visitors we have, that 14 million, uh, includes people that come from Effingham County for a doctor's visit. Uh, and that sort of thing. But I, I think probably most of what you're seeing is visitors. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of people here. It's just those of us that live here um, have come to appreciate air conditioning, so, this time of year anyway. Anybody else? Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.